Good morning. We welcome you to the worship services of the Waverly Church of Christ. This morning, we will continue our worship service as it has been for the last few weeks with congregational singing, scripture reading by our brother Ronnie Moore, and a prayer, more congregational singing, a lesson by brother Jeff, and then congregational singing. We will have then an opportunity to take of the Lord's Supper as a family, and then we'll have a closing song and a closing prayer. We want you to know that we are praying for you and we are praying with you. If you need anything from the church here, feel free to contact us from our office number at 931-296-3213, our Facebook page at facebook.com slash WAVCOC, our website at www.waverlychurchofchrist.org. Again, we are praying for you, and we are praying that God continues to bless you during this time. scripture reading will be taken from the, the book of Luke chapter 9 verses 23 through 26. Luke chapter 9 verses 23 through 26. Verse 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake 
the same shall save it. For what is a man's advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Would you please bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. And Father, we're thankful for each and every blessing Thou has blessed us with. Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to worship You. Even though we're not as simple as the congregation, we are in mind and spirit. And Father, we're thankful for the tools that we have to use, such as the internet with Facebook, our telephones, and our TVs as a method to reach out to others in our congregation that we can worship you. And Father, we pray that it will be pleasing in your sight. Father, we pray to be with the families that recently lost loved ones. And Father, we pray, continue to pray for those. And we pray that you will give them peace and comfort in the days ahead. And Father, we pray to be with our families and friends and members of this congregation. And Father, we pray that thou will protect them from this disease. We also pray that thou will be with those on our prayer list. And Father, we pray, if it be thy will, that they may be restored once again, that they might be able to return back into their normal walks of life. And Father, we pray to be with those that will have upcoming surgeries and procedures and treatments. And Father, we pray to be with their doctors and their nurses, that they have the wisdom and the knowledge to use the right procedure, the right treatment, and the medication. And Father, we pray with these that their health may be quickly restored. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that they will be with our upcoming graduates at this time, Martha Jane Hooper, Chandler Warren. Father, we pray to give, uh, to keep them in your care as they begin their next step in their lives to continue their education. We're also mindful of our missionaries that are busy at this time, Father. We pray that they will continue to give them the strength and comfort them in the days as they reach out to the lost. Father, we pray that they'll be with Brother Jeff and also to be with, the, uh, be with us as we listen to these words that he speaks to us from your word, that we might apply them to our lives, Father. As we apply them to our lives, to help us become better Christian. As we walk our daily walk, Father, that others may see thee in us and want to know what, more about you, to come unto you before it's everlasting too late. And Father, we're thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, for coming to this world, being that perfect example, that we might pattern our lives after him. Father, we pray to forgive us for our sins. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning. We are so glad to have you with us this Sunday morning here at Waverly Church of Christ. And as you notice, we are once again coming to you virtually, but we are glad that we're able to do so and thankful for this opportunity. Last week, we looked at the confession of Peter of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. But if you'll notice, after Jesus says this, there is something else that he says to his disciples that was quite disheartening for them, or at least I think it probably was, because what we find in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, one verse before our reading this morning, are these words. Jesus said that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and be raised up again the third day. Put yourself in the disciples' shoes for just a moment. Jesus had just told them that he was going to build his church and that the gates of Hades would not prevail against it or overpower it. And then he turns right around and says that he is going to be killed and raised up again on the third day. I imagine that when they tried to compare these two statements, it left them a bit confused, as it would of us, not knowing, as we do today, what happened. But with all of that, it's what he says next that must have challenged their thinking even more. Because he goes on, as you may have noticed in our reading this morning, to tell them that those who would associate with him, who would come after him, must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow him. All of that, these instructions, I might say, were not just for the 12. They were for every single person from that time forward who would want to join themselves to the calls to Jesus Christ. This morning, as we delve into the passage that was read for us a moment ago, I want to encourage you to look with me more in depth at what Jesus now says to his disciples, because there are two things I want us to notice. One is how, the other is why. How is it that we come after him? And number two, why would we want to do that? What is it that would motivate us to do the things that he tells his disciples they're going to have to do if they're going to come after him? Well, what we find Jesus saying next is this. He says that if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. The word that he uses there for deny is a word that means to repudiate, to renounce, or to disown. It's the same word that was used of Peter's three denials of Jesus there in the courtyard of the high priest on that evening following our Lord's arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Living a crucified life, following after Jesus Christ, means that we must renounce our own self-interest for the sake of Christ in the gospel. It means that we renounce our pride, we instead choose to exalt God. It means that we renounce our own stubborn self-will and choose instead to live out God's will in our lives. It means that we reject seeking our own goals and desires and choose instead to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that we are no longer front and center in our lives. Christ now is. So the first thing he tells us is that if we wish to come after him, we must deny ourselves. But then there's that second thing he tells us, that we must take up our cross daily. Jesus talked about taking up a cross, but what cross was it he was talking about taking up? The cross of which Jesus spoke was not simply the inconveniences or the irritations of life. He was not talking about the trials and the hardships that we may encounter from time to time. No. When he spoke about taking up one's cross, the disciples who heard him use those words knew exactly what that meant because in their mind's eye, they could see someone carrying a cross through the streets of Jerusalem on their way to death. They understood what the Roman cross stood for. 
It stood for a slow, painful, agonizing execution. The cross, to see someone bearing the cross, was to see what in all reality was a dead man walking. He was carrying that cross to his own execution. And what Jesus was saying with all that is that that individual, as he gave up any interest, any hope of fulfilling anything that had to do with this life anymore, so we must put those things behind us. We must no longer consider those things important in our lives as well. The Apostle Paul, in a letter that he would write some years later to the Christians in Philippi, simply known as Philippians, there in chapter 3 and verse 7, would write these words concerning his own, if you will, rejection of the world's provisions. He says, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. That's what you and I are called to do, to count the things that may have been gained according to the world standards as loss because we now choose to follow Christ. There's a hymn that we often sing. It's a beautiful hymn. It has these words, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The crosses that you and I are called by our Lord to bear are the result of our conscious choice to live out our new life on a daily basis in Christ, in our marriages, in our homes, in our community, amongst our neighbors, at our workplace, wherever we may find ourselves living out what Christ calls us to live out on a daily basis. But there's something I need to say about these crosses. Not only do these crosses come as a result of our commitment to Christ, but they come in direct proportion to our commitment to Christ. In other words, the more devoted we are to Him, the more we can expect to bear a cross in our lives. So here Jesus has said that if anyone wishes to come after Him, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily. And when He says daily, He means that it's not something that I reach a point where I say, I've done it, I'm through. No, it is something we do every single day of our lives until we either pass from this life or until our Lord comes again. It's daily. But he says we take up our cross daily, and then there's that last point. He said, follow him. Jesus called his disciples to follow him. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, he called them from their fishing boats there on the shores of Galilee. Matthew, the tax collector, he called him from his booth there not far from where they were at. Not only that, they understood. They came to learn that in following him, they went where he went. They listened to what he said. They watched what he did. And you see, Jesus' desire was that these men might become like him. And they did. That is why Paul would write many years later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. That is what God intends for us to do, to imitate his son. And Peter learned the lesson as well, because in 1 Peter chapter 1, as he is talking about the sufferings of Christ, down in verse 21, he makes this statement. He talks about how Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. So when we follow him, you and I become like him. We, in following Jesus, learn to love the things that he loved. He loved his father. He loved his church the kingdom. He loved the lost, and he even loved his enemies. Not only that, it is to speak the things that he spoke. He spoke the good news of the kingdom of God, what we know as the gospel. And it is also to do as he did. He went about doing good. As Peter told Cornelius there in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, so this is how we are 
to associate ourselves with Christ. This is what it means to come after him. It means that we deny ourselves, that we take up our cross daily, and that we follow him. But why would we do that? Jesus gives us three reasons in the verses which follow. If you will notice, in most of our English translations, verse 24, verse 25, and verse 26 all start with the word for. He's giving us reasons as to why we should choose to live <clears throat> this crucified life. And the first of those, if you'll notice in verse 24, is this. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. We choose to live a crucified life because ultimately, in the end, we all want to be saved. We don't want to be lost. If you or I should seek to save our lives by not denying ourselves in the here and now, then what Jesus says to us is you need to know this. You're going to lose it in the end. To seek our own agenda now is ultimately to lose. However, if we let go of our selfish aims and instead live out the purposes of our Lord, then as we seek to do His will, we can know that we will not only be blessed by Him in this life, but ultimately, when this life ends, we have eternal life. What a blessing. The second reason he gives us is what we find in verse 25. There he writes these words, For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You know, when you compare the things of this world that we might gain with eternity, when you compare this world itself with eternity, what we realize is that the things of this world are insignificant. They're fleeting. They do not last. In Luke chapter 12, just three chapters beyond where we're at today, Luke records for us a parable that Jesus tells about a very wealthy farmer who plants a crop and then has a harvest like he's never had before. It is more abundant than any harvest he's ever had. As a matter of fact, his harvest is so large that his barns can't hold it all. And so he decides to tear down his barns and in place of them build larger barns so that he can house all of his harvest. He comments on that praises himself for having done it because now in his mind he can sit back take it easy and enjoy life he is wealthy but Jesus said that God has something else to say about that man he called him a fool and God went on to say as Jesus tells us to that man this night this very night your soul is required of you and now who will own what you have prepared what are you going to do? You're fixing to die. Everything you've put back in all of these barns is no longer yours. What are you going to do now? Jesus even commented on this poor man's choice. I called him a poor man because that really is what he was, spiritually speaking. Because what Jesus said is, so is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. There in Luke chapter 12, verse 21. All of the profit that we might make in this life, living for this world, it's nothing when you compare it with the eternal loss of our soul. Our lives, as James said, are vapors which appear for a little while and then vanish away. They're uncertain. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. The only thing that is certain is eternity. It lies ahead. If we spend our lives striving for position and wealth, taking no thought of the world that is to come, God would say of us as well that we are fools. Whatever you do, please, I beg of you, do not live your life in such a way as to forfeit your own soul, because I promise you, you cannot buy it back. There is one last reason that Jesus gives to us that should motivate us for living a crucified life. 
It's found in verse 26. There he says, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and the glory of his Father and of the holy angels. You know, there are many things in this world right now that are very uncertain. We just don't know what our future holds with all that's going on. But there is one thing that I know for certain beyond the shadow of a doubt, and it's this. Jesus Christ is coming back. He will return. As a matter of fact, if you look at Matthew chapter 25 and begin there in verse 31, you find that Jesus tells us what it's going to be like when he returns. Because there in verse 31, he tells us that he is going to come in his glory and in the and also he says with all the angels with him he tells us that he is going to sit upon his glorious throne and that all the nations are going to be gathered to him to him there in verses 31 and 32 and then he tells us that he is going to begin to separate each each person as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats the sheep will go on the right hand and the goats will go on the left and then he tells us what he's going to do with those sheep and those goats. He tells us that he will say to the sheep, he will welcome them into the kingdom that, as he says, has been prepared for them from the foundation of the world, down in verse 34. But to those who are on his left, the ones that he calls the goats, he will send them into eternal fire, which he says has been prepared for the devil and his angels. If you and I are ashamed of him now, he will be ashamed of us on that day. However, if we are willing to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to faithfully follow him, then he will joyfully confess our names before his Father. A little shame, a little humiliation now cannot begin to compare with the glory that awaits us there. You know, Jesus still calls us to a crucified life. He still calls us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and to follow him. But the question for each one of us is simple. Are we doing that? Are we living our lives each day with eternity in view? There's another hymn that I want to share with you as we draw this lesson to a close. It was written some years ago, but you will recognize the words... It carries a powerful message that goes along with our lesson. It says, Earth holds no treasure, treasures, but perish with using, however precious they be. Yet, there's a country to which I am going. Heaven holds all to me. Heaven holds all to me. Brighter its glory will be. Joy without measure will be my treasure. Heaven holds all to me. Whatever we must endure in this life in the way of living it out for Jesus Christ will truly be worth it. I promise you. But the question is, are you living your life today in obedient faith to Jesus Christ? If not, then why not deny yourself? Why not confess Him as Lord in Christ and have your sins washed away through His blood? And begin today to take up your cross on a daily basis and live for Him. If we can help you in that response in any way, please don't hesitate to contact us here at the Waverly Church of Christ. But we want to thank you for being with us in our worship and pray God's blessings upon you and your family.
Lord's Supper, let us look at these scriptures. They are taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. For which I have received of the Lord, that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us bow. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day. And Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to gather around the table. And Father, as we partake of this bread, we're, to which to us as Christians represents the body of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which was placed on Calvary's cross that we might have the remission for our sins. Father, now as we partake of this bread, may we examine ourselves to do so in a manner that be well-pleasing in thy sight. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let us bow. Again, Father, in like manner, we're thankful for this opportunity to take this cup, for which to us as Christians represents the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross, that we might have the remission for our sins. And Father, now as we partake of this, may we examine ourselves to do so in a manner that it be pleasing in thy sight. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning for worship service. At this time, would you please bow as we have our closing prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for another opportunity to worship you and for the listeners brought to us from your word. Father, we pray that it has been pleasing in your sight. We also, Father, pray that this pandemic will be short-lived and that we'll be gathered together once again as a congregation that we can worship you. Father, we pray to be with Brother Kyle and Kayla and to be with Brother Jeff and Becky as they continue to work with us on a daily basis. Father, we pray to continue to give them many more fruitful days to work with this congregation. Father, we also pray to be with our president and leaders of this nation. We also pray for the leaders of the other nations. Father, that they may continue to have the wisdom and the knowledge as they work through the issues that they oversee the problems that affect the world. We also pray to be with our military, law enforcement, first responders, the doctors, nurses, and scientists. And Father, we also pray that they will have the wisdom and knowledge as they continue their works from day to day to work out the issues with this pandemic crisis. And Father, we pray that a vaccine will soon be developed and be useful for us. And Father, we pray to be with each and every one of us. And Father, we pray to continue to be with our family, friends, and members of this congregation. And we also pray for their health. And Father, we're thankful for the greatest gift of which you had sent to us, your son, Jesus Christ, knowing how they were sent to this earth, him being our savior, that we can have the remission for our sins through him. Father, we love you, and we're thankful for your love that you've had for us, knowing that you are our refuge and strength in these times of trouble. May we continue to be that guiding light in this community. Father, we pray to forgive us for our sins. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. This has been the worship services of the Waverly Church of Christ. Your speaker this morning was Jeff Keel. We want to again reiterate that if you need anything from the church, if you just need prayers or if you need anything from us to go out and do for you, please let us know. You can visit our website at www.waverlychurchofchrist.org or follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash wavcoc and help us spread and share the good news of Jesus Christ. If you need to call us, our phone number is 931 296 3213. Again, we hope that you have a blessed day.